À force de se voir par écran interposé, on s'examine. On voudrait un nez parfait, des paupières d'enfant, un ventre plat, des seins ou des fesses augmentées. La demande se fait de plus en plus tôt et toujours plus nombreuse. Sans acte chirurgical, les piqûres de toxines botuliques ou autres l'ont beaucoup facilité. La frontière entre injection et injonction est-elle poreuse Avec Oren Marco, chirurgien plasticien et esthétique qui captive les réseaux sociaux, le docteur Mauricio Di Maio, inventeur d'une technique d'injection qu'il pratique internationalement, et Heather Widows, philosophe et autrice de Perfect Me, la beauté comme idéal éthique. Trois points de vue pour un monde meilleur. Moi, je m'appelle Oren Marco, je suis médecin, je suis docteur en chirurgie plastique reconstructrice et esthétique, puisque j'officie à mon cabinet et en clinique privée. Mais la moitié de mon temps, je le passe aussi à l'hôpital public, où euh, on s'occupe en fait des patients qui sont soit grands brûlés, soit pour ma part, effectivement, je me suis un peu euh, spécialisé dans la reconstruction liée au cancer de la peau. Pour moi, faire de l'esthétique, c'est aussi réparer les gens. Alors on répare peut-être pas la même chose, quelque chose qui ne se voit pas, mais on répare en tout cas l'âme des gens. J'ai vraiment l'impression d'aider les gens à, à booster leur ego, à enlever un complexe, à se réparer. Et, et je trouve que c'est assez noble aussi. I'm Heather Widows, I'm a philosopher at Warwick University in the United Kingdom and I'm author of Perfect Me, Beauty as an Ethical Ideal. I started working on beauty after having spent 15 years working on issues of global justice and ethics and gradually it seemed to me that beauty was becoming something that was fundamentally shaping what human beings could do and be. And this was just as important an issue of justice as very many of the things that I had worked on previously from body part sale to genetic ethics. My name is Dr. Mauricio de Mayo. I am a plastic surgeon from Brazil and I am the creator of the MD codes. The MD codes are specific injection sites in the full face where you can present surgical results without needing to do surgery. When I entered medical school, I wanted to be a psychiatrist because at that time, I thought it was very important to understand what people were feeling inside. Then going over many specialties, immediately when I saw plastic surgery, that you can make transformations concretely very fast, I changed completely to that. So I see a young woman having injectables, cosmetic injectables. She's late teens, early 20s, having injectables. Uh, I think she may have had work fillers on her lips, or it may be makeup. I mean, I, you know, what is and what is not natural is a really difficult concept. Is makeup natural? Is injectables natural? It's not, it's not my area of expertise. Sa bouche, elle est le stéréotype pour moi euh, d'une bouche injectée, même si les volumes ne sont pas euh, énormes. Elle est pour moi très peu naturelle. Euh, Peut-être que j'ai un regard euh, qui est un peu biaisé parce que c'est mon job et que je fais des injections au quotidien. Euh, en tout cas, moi, ce qui me plaît dans l'esthétique, c'est si même moi, je me trompe. Quand moi, je me trompe, je félicite le collègue qui a travaillé sur euh, la bouche ou les seins. Euh, là, en l'occurrence, euh, on ne se trompe pas et on voit immédiatement que ce sont des lèvres euh, injectées. This is an advertising picture, definitely. It's not a uh, scientific or medical picture. This gives an idea, I would say a false idea, what proper good medical practice mean. I think this patient, they belong this, to this new generation of people that they look in social media They want to look even more attractive, although she's already attractive. She's young with not so many problems on her face. And uh, this picture gives me idea that this is what people are looking for. You know, you look in social media 
and they would say, I want that. Beauty is absolutely a philosophical question. It's about what we can be and do in the world. It's about how we construct ourselves and our identity, who we think we are. What could be more philosophical than that? A memorable quote about beauty is the one that American philosopher Sandra Bartke used in the 1990s, where she says that soap and water, a shave, might be enough for him. For her, they are not. And what's so remarkable about that quote is it's not true anymore. Everybody, men, women, across demographics, everybody's doing more to achieve the beauty ideal of thin, firm, smooth and young. I think beauty is a little bit like projection. We end up by liking what we have in our own faces. I give an example. If I love my lips, I look at somebody and say, oh, you have beautiful lips. If I hate my nose, I look at something and say, oh, wow, I don't like your nose. Meaning, subjectively, this is a little bit tricky, especially if you have bad taste. So if I would put the definition for me, beauty is harmony. And harmony means you can have a little touch of imperfections that gives you the, what I would say, the seasoning of a good food. Le Brésil est le leader mondial des chirurgies plastiques avec 13,1% du marché. Plus d'un million d'interventions plastiques y sont pratiquées par an. 80% de la patientèle est féminine. Ce pays, qui est une autorité en la matière, est célèbre pour l'invention du BBL, le Brazilian Bat Lift, l'augmentation du volume fessier. Aujourd'hui, les Brésiliennes, et des patientes venues d'ailleurs, semblent lui tourner le dos. La dernière tendance est à la vaginoplastie. Le professeur Maurice Mimoun, qui est officier avant à l'hôpital Rothschild, maintenant à l'hôpital Saint-Louis à Paris, et il a écrit plusieurs ouvrages euh, il y a plusieurs années, dont un qui donnait beaucoup de sens à la chirurgie euh, plastique et esthétique, c'était « S'empêcher d'en faire trop ». Et, et « S'empêcher d'en faire trop », c'est aussi valable pour le patient euh, que, que pour le médecin ou le praticien qui va prendre en charge des patients, parce que bien souvent, on peut avoir envie de faire le mieux pour les gens, euh, mais on peut se perdre, on peut avoir envie de faire des techniques, etc., parce que c'est un métier très technique. What American journalist Gio Tolentino has talked about is the Instagram face, this face that has um, very big lips, very big eyes, uh, a much more defined nose. It's almost a cartoon face. It's a face that nobody has naturally, that we're all moving towards an Instagram face. And one interesting anecdote is that some cosmetic surgeons have told me that they are increasingly getting people coming to them, not with pictures of celebrities, uh, which used to be the case, but with their own doctored and filtered selfies and asking if they can be made to look more like their own, more Instagrammed, filtered images. So there is a homogenization, there's a sense which we all have to look the same and nobody's good enough without work. La volonté, en tout cas, d'avoir une peau plus parfaite, elle vient surtout des réseaux sociaux et que la normalité, en fait, c'est d'avoir des traces euh, et qu'il faut bien faire la dichotomie entre la vie normale et la vie sur les réseaux sociaux. J'ai vraiment l'impression que les filtres, en fait, vous montrent avec une peau toujours plus lisse, toujours plus, plus, plus nickel. Et quand vous vous retrouvez devant votre miroir et que vous voyez, euh, voyez votre peau, au lieu de vous dire « je vais faire très attention, je vais mettre de l'écran total, je vais me protéger, me protéger du soleil, je vais boire un peu plus d'eau, je ne vais pas fumer euh, », tout de suite, on pense à la case chirurgie esthétique et on va prendre un rendez-vous dans un cabinet d'esthétique. I think people will more and more get the satisfaction in the virtual world than in reality. You see, you just follow the social media, so people do create an environment that they believe they want to live. And then when they get into reality, they get shocked, depressed. But the realities that they see is not the reality that I was born with. Ethics is about how human beings should live in the world, how we should treat each other and our planet. And applied ethics is applying that theory to real world questions. So it really is about what we should do and how we should treat others. In Perfect Me, I wanted to call out the moral nature of how our valuing of beauty had changed. It used to be that beauty was a peripheral value, changed over time, it was a matter of taste. Yet it has become the case that beauty is a value framework which is very central to how we make decisions today, how we judge ourselves, how we judge others. 
And here I make a parallel with sexism and racism, the kind of negative comments on other people's bodies that happen day in, day out. Those are luckiest comments. I would say that we live in a completely different world. And I would even say, forgive me if I say so, they are already, may say, a new species. When I say a new species is because when they are born, they are already integrated with the digital. That's see, you see the avatars. En Europe comme en Amérique, on rectifie ce qui se voit. Au pays du soleil levant, la chirurgie esthétique est plus spirituelle. La tendance depuis 10 ans chez les Japonais, modifier ces lignes de la main. Un simple scalpel électrique brûle la peau et après un quart d'heure, on repart avec l'espoir d'une nouvelle vie. La majorité des clients sont des trentenaires accros à la divination. De manière plutôt stéréotypée, les hommes veulent voir dans leur paume la richesse quand les femmes veulent changer leur ligne de cœur. Désormais, les plasticiens potassent la chiromancie pour s'assurer que leurs dessins correspondent à des destins tarifés. Social media is absolutely part of what is shaping the global ideal. It's not just a market, it is a way of expressing who we are and what we value and a way of communicating. And there is something um, democratizing about social media. So there are positives about social media as well as disadvantages. However, it is the case that it is a fundamentally visual medium and two-dimensionally visual. Um, and we have not really come to terms with what it means to be living in an image-based world instead of a text-based world. And of course, that image-based sense of the world was completely exacerbated in lockdown and what was already happening escalated. Dr Beauty, c'était tout simplement un compte. Alors au départ, au début de l'ère Instagram, moi, j'avais pas du tout en tête de... de d'avoir un compte ouvert et de, 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 de prodiguer des conseils comme ça à beauté. J'ai juste euh, constaté, moi, moi que euh, quand je, je jouais de l'humour, je faisais véhiculer beaucoup plus de messages et mon, mon message était beaucoup plus impactant que euh, quand je faisais un petit discours moralisateur euh, euh, du genre euh, ne pas aller chez le chirurgien trop tôt, etc. En fait, le fait de mettre du second degré dans tout ce que je dis, le fait de, de tourner les choses autrement, avait un impact beaucoup plus fort. It's interesting that today, the patients that visit our office, they are very diverse. We see young patients, mature patients, something that has changed, it was mostly female patients. Now, male patients are getting into treatment. We're living longer. So we also have to adapt with our appearance. It's, it becomes very, very important. And sooner or later, it will become a mainstream. Just like dentistry, you have to learn to take care of your face. But the secret, the secret, I think, is to start earlier enough. Il y a eu un, un boom, un, un essor de l'esthétique, en tout cas euh, en France, je ne sais pas dans les autres pays, mais en tout cas en France, euh, post-Covid, euh, probablement lié au fait que pendant le confinement, les gens se sont retrouvés en face d'eux-mêmes et qu'il y a eu effectivement, bah, on n'avait pas grand-chose à faire, donc on faisait du sport, on serait on faisait attention à soi. En tout cas, on a prêté attention à son corps, à son visage. Parfait, je suis en télétravail. Euh, bah, C'est pas grave si j'ai quelques bleus. De toute façon, je suis en télétravail, donc je vais bosser de la maison. Personne n'en saura rien. So I think when COVID came here, that was something very interesting because the static business did not stop, even increased in some countries. People were not investing their money in travels. They could not get out. So we went and we saw people coming to do something for themselves. As the beauty ideal becomes more important, it transforms our values and how we see ourselves and others. And we treat it more like virtue and vice. So we say things like, oh, I've been naughty today. I ate that naughty piece of cake. Or I've been good today. I went to the gym. We do this to other people too. We say things like, oh, she's let herself go, or wow, doesn't she look great? And those are judgments that go deeper than simply being about appearance. And sometimes we're using them in other ways. As beauty becomes so dominant in our society, it becomes a, a very prominent form of talk. So when we say to a friend, you look beautiful today, I love your jacket, Sometimes that's just friendship talk. And what we're really saying is, you're my friend, I love you. When you say about evolution, right? So should we accept what nature presents to us, right? So this is one possibility. Another possibility that has happened is this. We always, as human beings, we created a lot of 
solutions to have a longer life with better quality. You see hormone replacement or the appearance of the cars. We are not uh, living anymore in caverns. Do you understand? So, you know, the teeth, imagine the teeth. Every time that we had pain the teeth, we would take them out and people would lose their teeth. So should we not restore it? So when you go to aesthetics, you have to think in the same way. So why should I let my skin drop? Why should I have my eyes looking so tired? Si les Français sont discrets sur leurs opérations esthétiques, le nombre d'actes parle à leur place. Plus de 320 000 procédures de chirurgie plastique sont désormais réalisées chaque année. 18,3% des femmes demandent une augmentation mammaire et 14,9% des liposuctions. Encore plus d'hommes, 16,2%, font aspirer leurs amas graisseux, mais 18,6% font intervenir les chirurgiens sur leurs paupières. On peut avoir envie de consulter parce que, effectivement, via l'ère du digital, on est apte à, à avoir des informations qu'on va trouver un peu partout sur les réseaux sociaux et on se dit, ben, je vais aller demander. On est quand même dans une société en France où, finalement, les gens écoutent beaucoup le praticien et le médecin. Et même si on a des envies, ben, on ne passe pas forcément à l'acte. I think when you talk about body reshape, it's different from the city you're living at, right? So imagine, uh, when you're in Rio, you're more exposed to the beaches, so people have a different type of culture, working out more and taking care about the shape. When you go to other cities like Sao Paulo, this becomes secondary. To the fact that everybody goes to a procedure in their buttocks, I don't think this is more Uh, something a legend than reality. You know, people do treat, but it's not like a mainstream as we see for injectables, for example. For us, Brazilians, it's very important. It's a common place for you to be willing to look well, to express that you look attractive or youthful. There has been a long narrative in Brazil that you fix the person by fixing the body and it's really about raising esteem and conscious and, and building confidence. Uh, I'm deeply suspicious of those narratives. So sociologist Deborah Gimlin, she writes a lot about cosmetic surgery narratives and she compares people in different places. So, for instance, women in the United Kingdom have very different stories about why they have surgery compared to women in America. Um, and that's very culturally tied up with our values. You've seen the same language around dieting. So there's parts of the world where you couldn't possibly talk about dieting because it's um, similar to starving. And people talk about purging or fasting. The narratives change, but all of the practices lead to the same homogenized bodies. On le voit tous, il y a des femmes qui se ressemblent avec les sourcils relevés fox eyes, les pommettes comme si, les angles de la mâchoire. Mais j'ai pas l'impression qu'on a, qu 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 a cela, en tout cas en Europe, j'ai l'impression qu'on est quand même très très loin de cela. J'ai l'impression, moi en tout cas, quand je répare un nez, euh, ben, réparer un nez pour moi c'est enlever un complexe, ça veut pas dire le standardiser. Effectivement, moi, quand je tombe sur des comptes, euh, des, des, des publications de comptes euh, Instagram ou euh, Google d'autres pays, il y a une standardisation euh, des actes. C'est un, une espèce de, de mondialisation euh, de la beauté. I think Brazil is completely different because we are a cosmetic oriented country. And when I travel to Europe like this France, it's very interesting because French people, they do not want anybody to know that they were treated. And I would say even worse in Germany. I think in Germany, and I have some German patients here in Brazil, sometimes they consider vanity shameful, right? But in Brazil, no. It's a sort of status for you to announce that you have been treated. Of course, even in Brazil, we have more conservative people like this top class. They definitely prefer not to make any treatment evident. <laughs> Kardashian body, the thin with curves body, is very globally dominant. 
So some people have argued that this is kind of a return to a hypersexualized female body, uh, and that's undoubtedly true. But it's also the case that we have these hypersexualized male bodies, these very buff bodies, these inverse triangles that are big and unrealistic and firm in very similar ways. Uh, I increasingly think that sexual attractiveness and living up to the beauty norm come apart, um, that these are bodies that we're aspiring to that are very separate in a way from what we actually find attractive in the world. They are not bodies that you want to hold or touch. They are, they are not real human bodies. They are very, very plastic perfection, two-dimensional performance bodies. So I think it has much less to do with sexual attraction than beauty used to do. I actually think sexual attraction and perfect bodies are separating a little bit. Il y a eu quand même des effets de mode. Il y a eu, euh, je pense notamment aux Kardashians, euh, qui ont vraiment propulsé l'ère euh, du fessier pendant plusieurs années. Et d'ailleurs, là, elles reviennent en arrière. Euh, et et c'est vrai que même si on ne va pas me le demander expressément, ça reste quand même un peu un baromètre. Et, euh, et même si on ne me dit pas « non, je voudrais des fesses un peu comme Kardashian, mais en tout cas une taille très marquée euh, », c'est vrai qu'elles ont un peu euh, influencé tout cela. En tout cas, je vois un retour en arrière déjà de cette pratique. Le combat contre les discriminations physiques agit-il Selon une récente enquête de l'Université d'Oxford menée sur 11 000 hommes de 33 ans, un visage agréable favorise l'accès à l'emploi, aux promotions et même à un meilleur salaire. La fiche de paye de celui reconnu comme beau est de 15 supérieure à celle d'un autre considéré comme laid. Et un homme grand gagne 5% de plus qu'un de petite taille, à potentiel égal. The Everyday Lookism campaign uh, was modeled on the Everyday Sexism campaign, a bit like Me Too. The aim is that people share their lookist stories, their day in, day out experiences of body shaming. The aim is that it benefits the individual because they can show that it's not okay to have been treated like that. And it also benefits us collectively as Each one of those stories can be quite distressing to treat lookist comments in the way we treat sexist and racist comments, to say that they're not okay. So collectively, we can kick back and stop body shaming and end lookism. So even though people might still think it, they wouldn't say it, it would create a kinder atmosphere. Just as people are still sexist, but they rarely say those overt sexist things at the workplace, in the school, in the way that they did previously. I wanted to introduce this concept. It says the next human. What's a next human? So I think the next human that will inhabit this planet is somebody that they will be older and older, but with great appearance, great health, taking care of their food, nutrition, medical status, and also the looks. Currently, in the 21st century, It's not uncommon that somebody looks at least 10 years younger from their chronological age. But this is medical intervention. Medical intervention for health, medical interventions for aesthetics. So the next human combines both health markers for health and I introduced the aging trigger points. Qu'est-ce que va devenir euh, en tout cas, toutes ces personnes injectées beaucoup trop tôt, traitées beaucoup trop tôt, parce qu'on ne va pas finalement avoir euh, des gens qui n'ont pas d'âge, ce qui existe hein, euh, déjà, parce que moi, ça m'arrive même de donner cet argument quand je refuse quelqu'un, je lui dis, écoutez, là, vous êtes très jolie à 39 ans, si vous commencez les injections, on va penser que vous en avez 50 et que vous avez fait des injections. Donc ça n'a pas, pas de sens. Mais euh, je ne sais pas si on ira aussi loin, parce que là, c'est un scénario de science-fiction. Young people are both increasingly obsessed with their bodies and fighting very hard around environmental campaigns and other single issue politics. But in a way, why would we ask for consistency from any generation? We're only beginning to realize how much the beauty ideal has changed and how dominant that is. And we haven't helped young people understand this very much. We haven't given them tools. We haven't given them concepts. We're only just beginning to talk about lookism. So the risks of very much body work 
are actually not well tracked to is it surgery or is it not? And there is a real worry around injectables that they are much less regulated in most places in the world compared to surgery. Je mets pas dans des cases des gens. On peut avoir des gens qui font attention à soi, euh, qui euh, vont manger healthy, euh, se mettre une petite crème, faire attention au soleil et venir se faire un petit botox et être écolo. J'ai euh, des patientes que je vois être euh, euh, parce que des fois un peu connues, euh, qui militent effectivement euh, fortement euh, pour des actes écolos, qui viennent euh, au cabinet euh, faire deux, trois piqûres euh, ou s'occuper de soi. Comment je vois l'évolution en tout cas de la médecine ou de la chirurgie esthétique en 2050 Je n'ai pas l'impression qu'on qu va, qu va lâcher l'affaire. So, in 2050, we are talking about almost 30 years ahead, right So, the first thing I hope that's going to be better. But sometimes we are going to see a decline on many, many aspects, you see, like environment and also hunger. But let's think about the positive side because I'm, I'm optimistic. I think people will look younger and younger, healthier and healthier. And this, we are starting now. In 2050, I will be 80, six, but hoping to look like 66. By 2050, I really hope that we will have ended body shaming. Lookism will be as um, well understood as sexism is now, and we will no longer be saying the kind of things we say to other people about their bodies. By 2050, I dearly hope we live in a world with a less dominant and demanding beauty ideal, where we value far more diverse people, where we are kinder to each other and to the planet, and we are looking forward to future generations thriving in a beautiful human world.